Well, Helen, thanks for joining me. Um, growing up in a mining town in Arizona at the time you were growing up seems kind of exotic to me. What were your first memories of that? What a great place it was. I loved it. Mountains are beautiful. There's a great one great big white mountain there. It looked like an elephant's tooth. That's what they called it, too. Mm. And we played outdoors all the time. And we didn't worry about snakes or anything like that. Well, that's because your mom was a pretty good shot. Yes, yeah, she was. Yeah. So tell about the time that you found a, a rattlesnake approaching your sister. Well, <clears throat> we had a big long screen porch in front of our house, and I happened to be inside, and the kids were, my two brothers and my sister were outdoors playing, and I just happened to look out through the screen and see this rattlesnake heading for my little two-year-old sister. So I ran and told my mom, and she got this pistol and came right back and shot through the screen and killed the snake. Wow. Yeah. No so, fooling uh, around. I didn't even know she could shoot a gun, so that surprised <laughs> me. <laughs> well, that's the kind of mother you want for home defense, I'm thinking. <laughs> now, your dad was an accountant for the mining company, was yes, that right? Yes, he was. And it was a gold mine. And... Um, how did they transport the gold bars to uh, the bank? Oh, well, the mine, they had mules that uh, pulled the carts that pulled the uh, bits of gold that were mined out of the tunnel and out and, and over to the... Refinery? The, yeah, the, uh, they call it the gold room, I guess. Mm. And then they had to melt it down and put it in bars. And Dad would take it every, I don't know how often, it seems probably once a month or something like that. He'd have to take it to the Kingman, Arizona, to ship it to the company on the railroad. <clears throat> and so he usually took one of us kids along, my brother or me, so that people would think he didn't have anything important too long and they wouldn't try to <laughs> rob him and steal the gold. <laughs> so you guys were his cover. Yeah, you know, we right? were his cover. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. How big a town was it? Not very large was it town we didn't live in a town we just lived in a little mining camp but mm -hmm. it was kingman arizona yeah yeah kingman arizona at that time was not a great big town okay but it had a hotel and a ra railroad and yeah it was moderate type town not, not big <laughs> and you were there until about 10 years old and then your family moved to colorado or so Yes, so I lived the first 10 years of my life in the Mojave Desert of Arizona. Yeah. And then we moved to, the good company moved my dad to uh, Eureka, Colorado, mm -hmm. the lead, silver, and zinc mine instead of gold. Ran out of gold and gold road. <laughs> so we were in Colorado for one year, and then they asked him if he'd like to go to Alaska and work there, would have put the dredges in. So he thought he would check it out. So in 1927, he went to Alaska and my mom uh, took us kids to California where my dad's sister lived. Mm. And so we stayed in California for one year waiting to see if we we're going to go to Alaska. But uh, dad liked it and he, there was a college here and he didn't know that. He was so pleased that there was a, co the, you know, it was an old college that before they called it the University of Alaska. Yeah. Just the college. <clears throat> so we moved uh, so that he wanted us to go to school. Most of all, he wanted me to finish school and get a degree and everything. He was just adamant about that. I don't know why, but... Well, yeah, I was going to ask you because he wanted you to make sure you and your brothers and sisters all got college education. Yeah, he did. Uh -huh. And did he come from a background with a prized education or was that he unique in that sense? Uh, I never knew his accent. You know, he had nine brothers and three sisters or something like that. He came oh, from, he was the last, he was a baby in a great big family. Mm. And his dad got killed in a civil war, I guess it would be. And so his grandma, I mean his mom, 
my grandma, she had to take care of all those kids and they lived on a farm or something. But the older ones were sort of grown up, mm -hmm. like Aunt Met Alice was the oldest one and she was, you know, probably 30 years old or something. I don't know. She, she was like a mom to him rather than a, an, a, you know, a sister. So yeah, he, he liked it, but he decided to, uh, I don't know how he decided, he never did say, to take a course in uh, uh, math and calculus and all those things. So he, he went to college mm -hmm. for just a year or two, I think, but he became an, an, an accountant. Audit accountant, uh -huh, an accountant. He liked that, and so then they were they were moving to the west, the people that he was working for. So he worked for, what is it? This is now the called company? Wells Fargo uh, had this um, co coach. They went from Illinois clear out to Arizona and California. Mm -hmm. So he got a job, uh, went out there and got a job in uh, Arizona. So and he liked Arizona, and so he stayed there. And, yeah, and that's where he met my mom. Go west, young man, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, that was it. Well, it strikes me, you grew up with a lot of enterprising and resourceful people, as you'd imagine um, a frontier mining town would mm -hmm. be, consist of. And did that influence <coughs> you when you went to college and became a civil engineer? No, oh, what it influenced me to be a civil engineer is because I like the outdoors. I like to be outdoors all the time, and I was really a tomboy, not a little girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I like to hunt, you know, birds and uh, play <laughs> baseball and do stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I, I wanted to work at something that would keep me outdoors all the time. That's the main reason I took engineering. <laughs> so you guys must have taken to Fairbanks pretty well when you got here. Oh, we liked Fairbanks a lot. You bet we did. What were your first impressions when you got there? Well, I don't know. We just thought it was great. We all liked it. My dad, my mom, and us kids, we all loved it mm -hmm. very much. And didn't mind the cold in the winter or anything like that. It was good. We had a nice warm house to live in. We had been living in uh, uh, smaller places. <laughs> but when we came to Fairbanks, we got to live in a, a two-story house that had oh. uh, Running water and steam heat. <laughs> oh, you were living in luxury. <laughs> we never had that before, so mm -hmm. we thought that was pretty nice. We really liked it. Yeah. We weren't very far from school, but except for the fact that my dad worked for a mining company, and they were kind of on the edge of town, and so we had to go to school in a the bus. So it wasn't a regular bus. It was more like a van. They had the um, just planks on each side where they, all of us kids sat and they'd take us to school every day because the mining uh, part of Fairbanks was kind of outside of the city. It was across the river from the town. So uh, you've been there so you know where, what it's like. Yeah. Sure. So <clears throat> we, uh, they didn't want us to walk in the wintertime because it was so cold and everything. They didn't make warm clothes like they do now and things weren't so warm. We had mucklucks like the Eskimos did. We wore a lot of those. Mm. and mittens and things but yeah so we they took us to school and brought us home which is fine so then we all could do our chores when we got home all they had that all figured out <laughs> what was the schoolhouse like was that similar to Arizona where where do you, you used to like a one-room schoolhouse yeah the small towns like Colorado and, and uh, Gold Road has had little uh, buildings and Oatman they had a little bigger one it wasn't very big though so, uh, yeah, it was uh, the schoolhouse was, I don't know how many students we had. The whole building, I bet we didn't have more than 50 at the most, maybe not that many. But yeah. It, it was, uh, we had a, uh, a gym room and so we could play basketball. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That was about it. <laughs> but for at least a, a while, your brother and you visited your aunt and uncle down in Pasadena, was it? And you attended a big school then. Yeah, well, that was different. That was when uh, we moved down to, that's when we moved to California, actually, before we came to Alaska, mm. because we went from Colorado to California and stayed in California almost a year while it, they were building the dredges and everything, and we couldn't come until they had that done. I see. <clears throat> so we didn't come right away. Yeah, it was a 
Was it a sort of a culture shock to find being in a big school with so many students? Well, that part of it was rather overpowering. There was 10,000, uh, what did they call it? It was high school, but it was junior high school and senior high school. And Put together. Huge big place, and we had never, <laughs> we'd been mostly going to one-room schools. Yeah. Know? So that was a shock, all right. I'll bet it was. <laughs> we rode on a streetcar from our place in Pasadena down to the uh, place where the high school was every day. And uh, we always passed uh, Zane Gray's house. And I read it all his books, and I well, kept always peering out the window trying to see if I could see Zane Gray, but he never came out of the house so I could see him. <laughs> How disappointing. You have a, an author you want to see, and you never show up. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. when you got to Fairbanks, um, following your dad's sort of instructions, uh, did you go directly to the University of Alaska after you graduated from um, uh, Fairbanks schools? High school? I graduated from Fairbanks High School, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I went, yes, I did. I went right to next, next fall of the year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, tell us about the time when you, you went, part of your education was down in Pasadena in that area, and you stayed with your aunt, and was her husband, let's see, the chief of police? Did yeah, I have that Uncle right? Charlie Pas Kelly was the chief of police of Pasadena. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he was. And, yeah. uh, that must have been kind of interesting. Did his position give you any kind of uh, unique experiences? Well, yeah. <laughs> in the Rose Parade, Uncle Charlie always led the parade because he was the chief of police, and it was an open-air car. And so Becky and I, my friend, we got to ride in the car with him and Aunt Catherine. We all got to be in the parade with Uncle Charlie. And I kept looking for some of the kids I knew from school, and I never saw a soul I knew. <laughs> but it was fun, just the same. <laughs> yeah, then you could go back to school the next day. That was me. I was in the Rose Parade. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It was fun. So let's talk about the University of Alaska. Um, there, it was a one-room college at that point, right? It was uh, Agricultural College and School of Mines when you started. Was that right? It wasn't a one-room. <laughs> well, I mean a one building, I should yeah, say, not one room. Yeah, two-story. It was two stories. There was a basement. Mm -hmm. It had a second floor. The home ec was on the second floor. And the engineering was on the first and second, and also down in the basement. The mining people were down in the basement. Yeah, it was great. I, I liked it instantly. Did you? Yeah, there's lots of stuff to do. Now everybody was nice, and all the kids were good kids. And Not a large student body at that point, though, right? I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember how many, but uh, probably uh, 20, maybe, or something. Mm, yeah. Now, this was Dr. Bennell was the president at that mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. What was he like? Dr. Charles Bennell, he was an or, not an ordinary man. He was, had been a judge, I think, and mm -hmm. he was kind of strict. And, uh, but he was a very good president. We had always assembly every week. We had an assembly, and I shouldn't remember the day, but I don't. But one day a week, we would all get together and, uh, at the, well, the big room we had up at the second floor. And somebody would talk about something, or some professor, or some group, like the miners would give a program, or the CEs would give a program, or something like that. So it was very, like a family, kind of, you know, there weren't that many people there. And he was like the strict father at the top, right? Yeah, he was. He, he was good, but then he uh, was out planting potatoes in front of the <laughs> university, too, so that for the, we had dinner there. I mean, there was a... For the, there were men's dorm and women's dorm separate, and uh, everybody ate at, down in the dining room, which was below the girls' dorm. Yeah, so it was. And uh, I'm kind of impressed that you and a friend decided to redecorate or repaint a <laughs> section of. The well, paint in those days smelled pretty loud. If you remember how paint was, it was strong. <laughs> yeah, it sure was. And it was pretty run down in there. And the ladies' room where you went in and hung up your coat, and there was a little bathroom stuff. We thought we'd fix that up so it would look a little nicer. So another friend and I bought some paint. I mean, it wasn't really paint. They called it something else. I can't think of the name. Smelly of it. stuff. Yeah, it was smelly <laughs> stuff. And we stayed up all night. 
and wow. painting the walls and everything. And we got it all painted. And then the president and everything started at 8 o'clock in the morning, so we had to be done by that. So we got it finished, and you could smell it all over. You didn't know somebody was painting. <laughs> so we knew Dr. Bennell would catch on to it, and his yeah. office was more or less across from the lady's place there. So but he never said a word. Oh, so he didn't call you guys on the car? No, he huh? didn't. He yeah. didn't. So we were really surprised about that. <laughs> I bet you pleased, too. <laughs> yeah, we were pretty happy. Now, there's a wonderful photograph of you on the women's basketball team. Oh. Yeah, and so you engaged in sports. Mm -hmm. And did you join the, the Engineering Society? Uh, yeah, I was a member of the Civil Engineering Society also. I was in the basketball team. Mm -hmm. And you became president, is that right, of the society? Well, yeah, it was a dirty trick. <laughs> <laughs> a reluctant president. <laughs> yeah. It was okay, though. They didn't, I didn't know what they were doing until I, they did it. Well, what did they do? Well, let's see. Somebody else was a president, and then all of a sudden they said they just couldn't be there, had to leave, and so uh, they appointed me a, a vice president, of course. Oh, of course. So, so then uh, I had to take charge because this other person left unexpectedly. And so they set you up, basically. Uh, they Is did. that right? Yeah, they did. Yeah. Did anybody, I mean, here you are, you're soon to be the first civil engineering woman graduate of the University of Alaska. Um, did anybody treat you differently than any other engineering student? Or No, people, nope. no they didn't seem to do that in the early days. Everybody mm -hmm. was just friends with everybody, it seemed like. Yeah. yeah, and did you get to do a lot of outdoor activities? That's why you went into that program. Yeah, we um, had to do all our surveying outdoors. Uh huh. Uh, even in the winter time, to, to photograph the northern lights, say I just started getting interested in the northern lights, and there was a man there who, it was down in a different department, um, and so uh, <coughs> we were in that class too, and we were uh, appointed to go out and take pictures of the northern lights. So I mean, we went out by North Pole to do it. We had to go out of town a little ways. And I remember it was about 50 below. It was so cold out there trying to take those pictures. Yeah, but, uh, I can imagine. Yeah, so we only did that once. <laughs> yeah. Well, you learn to, to do everything an engineer does. And so when you graduate in 1936-37, you, um, you get a job with the Fairbanks uh, FE company? Yeah, uh, Fairbanks and Mining Company. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And what did you do there? Oh, I uh, made map, maps and uh, ran, the print, ran the blueprint machine and uh, also had to plot a lot of uh, maps about the drilling holes, uh, you know, plot the maps with all the drill holes on it and how deep they went and things like that. Just miscellaneous kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy the work? Oh yeah, I like I liked it. Yeah. I, I've always liked math and I've always liked being busy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I imagine being uh, at working for a mining company at that point must have been pretty busy. Um, I'm going to jump ahead just a tad though because not long after you graduate <laughs> and you have this mining, you go down to the University of Washington to study architecture. Did you want to be an architect at, at yeah, that Yeah, I always, I always wanted to know about building houses and things, and I used to draw pictures of houses I thought I would like and stuff. Yes, I was interested in becoming an architect, but I never did finish that. Mm. <laughs> and then when you come back, you marry Frank White. Is that right? Well, not immediately, but I did get married later, yeah. Mm -hmm. And started a family. Mm -hmm. And then the war comes along. Yeah. And you end up with an important position at the Boeing plant. But first off, how did you get from Fairbanks down to the Seattle area? Were you there when war was declared? <coughs> no, I was, but that's, uh, I had a friend who moved down there and she had some children. But I, uh, my husband worked on the dredges and in the wintertime they didn't work. And uh, so I asked him if I could go down 
would take the bus down to Valdez and catch the boat to go down to Seattle and then over to uh, Tacoma where his parents lived so they could see the oh. children. I had two children by then and I wanted to go down there and, and uh, get acquainted with my in-laws. Sure. So that's what happened and he, uh, with his last check, he paid the way for us to get down to Seattle. And the funny part of it was when we got there in the boat, uh, another boy from uh, Fairbanks had gotten the measles or some kind of, um, it wasn't the measles, it was, I forgot what it was called, but anyway, they were going to quarantine the boat and not let anybody off. Holy smokes. And I convinced the captain and everybody that we hadn't been with those people, we hadn't seen those people, we didn't eat with them or anything, and that the parents were waiting to pick us up in Seattle, so we just had to get off. And so they let us get off. <laughs> oh, you must have been eloquent then, too. <laughs> so it was pretty important. They drove up from Tacoma and, you know, never knew, saw us before. So that worked out. And, we, and then we lived with them in Tacoma for about a year, I guess. And then the next year, Frank came down and he got a job at Boeing, too. So then we got a, our own place. But in the meantime, I, for one year, I had to live with his parents mm. in Tacoma and catch a ride to... <laughs> over to Boeing's every day to go to work. Where were you when um, uh, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor? Do you remember? Uh, yeah. I was visiting a lady from Fairbanks in, oh. uh, in Tacoma. I happened to go over there. It was a Sunday, and I went over and we were there and announced on the radio this, you know, and she had about two, two boys, maybe three, and they got all excited. They were hollering and yelling all ready to run down it enlist right now oh, I bet. really a wild house there when they heard that yeah so yeah i just happened to be at her house that day when it happened yeah working for boeing they manufactured many of the warplanes mm -hmm. including the b-29 mm -hmm. and uh, when you first you ended up kind of overseeing and being uh, ensuring the quality of those aircraft but that isn't how you started out at boeing was it no, I started out writing up shop orders for making parts of the airplane. Mm. So I had to learn. It was like going to school and getting paid for it. It was wonderful, really. It was a great education. Yeah. I had to learn all about the different materials and what they would do or wouldn't, or wouldn't do. And uh, write up these, uh, give this to the people that make the parts and so forth to put make the airplane. Right. <laughs> It was really interesting, and you know about all the new materials that were coming in, and I had to go down to the, the shop where they kept all the materials and get accustomed to what was there and how they treated it, whether they, they did, uh, did some strange treatments that I never quite understood. Let's see, the pistol, what do they call it? Passivating, pickling, passivating, and something oh, else. Yeah, what they I, do, I do those to my pickles. That's <laughs> Well, a whole bunch of treatments that they give the aluminum to make it like they want it to be. So I had to learn a lot. So it was like oh, going bet. to school and, you know, learning. But when Did they, they know you were an engineer when you first hired on? No, I don't think they did. But then they found out I could read blueprints. So then I got promoted after that. I'll bet you did. <laughs> so they took me over to uh, Laurentin. And I was a, an a, um, inspector. inspector. Yeah, there were 263 government furnished items that the military uh, put in the plane <clears throat> and we were to check those items to be sure they were in the plane and that they were workable. And so that was what I was doing was inspecting every B-29 to see that everything was in there that was supposed to be there and if it really worked. So that was pretty interesting and I loved crawling through that old B-29 because you know the front was a Norden bomb site would be in first front, very front in the glass part and it was a pilot and the co-pilot and then it was a navigator <coughs> and then there was a, the um, um, Bombardier? Uh, no, uh, big long tunnel across the uh, Bomb racks. The bomb racks took about at least half of the airplane. It was a lot. Mm. And this tunnel was padded, and it was probably about, what, 36 inches in diameter, I suspect, because it was big enough to crawl through. So you have to crawl through that every day to get back to the, the gunners on the side, the side gunners and the tail gunner. Mm. You have to go back all the way through. So I crawled through that uh, tunnel. Everybody did who wanted to go from one end to the other. And then at near the end of the war, 
Uh, I knew the war was going to end sometime. I kind of wanted to take a ride on that B-29, but I didn't ask anybody because I don't think they'd say yes. <laughs> whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> so you're the inspector and you stole away on a B-29 test flight? Yes, I did. Okay, so... <laughs> well, I was there every time before the t took off, before the pilots took off. They'd close the, you know, the big... Um, um, Things that were underneath the plane. Bombay doors? Bombay doors, yeah. They didn't close those tight. And so, <clears throat> and I was always the last person there because I was the one that took the red tag off of the thing to tell me, yeah, it's okay now. There's lots of gas and everything. You can go. It's ready to go. So I was always the last one there. So I'd take that red thing off and then I'd get out, got down there. And I knew they hadn't closed the bomb doors yet. So I jumped up there real quick and <laughs> just after they closed them. And I was in there, but then... It was a pressure door going from the bomb bay into the, to the, was it the navigator's place? And so I went out, well, after we took off, I was trying and trying to open that door. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm going to get stuck here for the whole thing. Yeah, I can't get the door so, open. Yeah. But I really pulled on it hard and I got out and got up to the <laughs> navigator's place. And I crawled into the um, tunnel and it was pretty long. And... Then in the middle of it, they had a bubble on the top, you know, a glass bubble, so you could sit there and look out. So I was sitting up there, <laughs> looking out, just having a great time watching everything. <laughs> and, You're in one of the gun turrets, just yeah, watching? Yeah, I did. It was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And so I was having a good time. And then all of a sudden, along came the navigator. He crawled through the tunnel. He said, what are you doing here? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I'm going to have to tell Scotty, because if you had a... Uh, you know, um, parachute or something, it might be okay, but I'll have to tell Scotty you're here. I said, okay. So I went down to see Scotty. He was a pilot, and I knew him too. And he said, well, if you had got permission, or if you had a parachute, I could probably let you stay, but I can't let you stay as it is. He says, where do you want to get off, over in Seattle or back in Renton? And I said, oh, I think you better take me back to Renton. <laughs> Please go by the side so nobody will notice you if you can. So he landed way down by the lake and then let me out there. So I walked up way on the side, hoping nobody would see me. But when I came into the office, my boss said, I didn't see you get off that plane out there. <laughs> but he never reported me, so I didn't get any bad marks. You are very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it would be hard to explain how you materialized in Seattle. <laughs> yeah. So they let you off at the end of the runway there, or what happened? Yeah, down by the lake. And so oh. I just walked up the whole side, was trying to hide as much as possible. <laughs> I don't think anybody else saw me except my boss, but he well, was. let's hope not. <laughs> and anyway, he didn't get mad at me. I was afraid he might. And then when the war ended, every day at 4 o'clock was when people changed to... Uh, um, time and when they ch day people were done and the night people came on and so over the loudspeaker one day it said uh, this is your last day at work you don't need to come tomorrow the war is over <coughs> so were you let go then well no I wasn't my boss said I'd like you to stay a couple weeks longer and to help me close up mm -hmm. so I got to stay two weeks longer which was great because I had supporting two little kids absolutely <laughs> Well, and I want to mention something else. Because of the importance of your war work, you never got to fly, but it, we should acknowledge that you qualified to become a WASP. Yeah, I did. Which Women's Air Force Service Pilot, yes. right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And tell us about that, because that's a remarkable aspect about your uh, war years. Well, I was quite disappointed that I couldn't go, but I knew I couldn't go because I had two little girls and I thought I could take them with me and just have an apartment or something and go to work, but no, I couldn't. And my mother was very unhappy when she discovered that I had applied for something like that. She wrote to all her friends, please tell me what a terrible person I was to even think of flying when I had two children. So uh, <laughs> it was getting kind of uh, hot. <laughs> so I... Uh, but the real reason you never did is because they said they needed you for the Boeing plant. Wasn't yeah, that, that right? was it. I got this telegram from, what was her name, the lady in charge of all the women pilots and signed by the General Arnold or somebody at the bottom. Got this telegram saying, report at, uh, 
What's the name of that place in Texas? Blue Bonnet, Texas, at a certain time and a certain day, you have been accepted. So I had all that. I was all ready to go. But when I decided I just better not go. <laughs> well, then, then, then the Boeing stepped and, and in Boeing, and said... Boeing, oh, that's right. They said that they wouldn't just give me leave anyway, that I was just as important for the war effort where I was at Boeing as I would be if I was a pilot. So they would not excuse me either. So that was the end of that. <laughs> yeah. Now, after the war and your work at Boeing, you and Frank go up to Alaska. Was there ever any question in your family that you returned to Alaska? Or what made you decide to, to go up there? Was it just work or did you guys love Alaska? We loved Alaska. <laughs> we just wanted to go back. But we didn't go to Fairbanks. We uh, caught an old, what kind of boat was it? It was kind of a, a freight boat sort of thing. And we, we caught that boat and we went to Sitka Actually, we went to Sitka to just get off there and then get on a Coast Guard boat to go over to Bjorka Island. We were assigned to Bjorka Island for two years. Mm. So that's we went over there, and uh, Frank was a radio man. <clears throat> and so he took, you know, all the planes that flew over, had to check in with the, the station there on Bjorka Island. So we lived there for two years. Then we moved to uh, Sitka and lived there for four years, and the kids went to school there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Bjorka, I take it, is pretty remote. Wasn't it just a military island? Civilians weren't allowed there. No, were they? they weren't. Uh, yeah. They weren't allowed when we lived there. Nobody could come ashore. Even they'd have to anchor out at the bay, but they couldn't come ashore because mm. it was federal. And yeah, it had a Coast Guard building there for the boys that lived there, and then there were three houses for people. We lived in one, and the guy that ran the power plant lived in his family lived in one, and the other one was for the visiting uh, <laughs> people. So there weren't many of us there. Pretty and, remote. So what did? Um, how did your kids react? Were, did they enjoy life there? Did you enjoy life there? Yeah, I taught school to my oldest girl. I got all of, all the books and everything I needed from a a school in somewhere back east. Anyway, they sent them to me, and so I taught her the first grade at home. Mm. And uh, then when I was pregnant with my third girl, and I had to get over to uh, Sitka in time to have their, th they didn't have a hospital for ordinary people. They had a hospital for native people or a hospital for uh, veterans or somebody. So there was no hospital there for me. Just a normal civilian. <laughs> yeah. So I did get permission from the uh, school, what's the name of that school? Uh, in Sitka, the high school in Sitka. Mount Edgecombe? Mount Edgecombe, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, to uh, have the baby there because they had a nurse uh -huh. teaching the children, uh, the young girl, young Eskimo girls and Indian girls about how to take care of her babies or something. So there was another house there. <laughs> and uh, so that was where I went to have the have my baby because that's the only place in town that was available. And of course, there was one doctor in Fairbanks and he was on a vacation. So there was a doctor from S Seattle that came up, uh, Mr. What was Rosenberg or something. I forget his name, but <laughs> He just came up to be there while the other man was out of town. And I never knew him or saw him either until I came over in the boat to check in and find out who he was. <laughs> and I stayed with some friends there in Isitka, and um, which is wonderful. They were very nice people. We knew them quite well. And as it happened, um, at that time, Frank sent the other girl over too. I took I took Phyllis with me because she's the oldest, and I'd taught her first grade, and I put her in school over in Sitka. So ah. then I was living with Brightmans, and it was just across the street from the school. And then my uh, husband came over and brought my second girl, Gail, and then she went with Louise, who was uh, lived there at that same place where we lived. And Louise kind of took care of her and took her up to the library with her when she went to work. So I didn't have to worry about. The kids, you know. Mm. So that must have been a relief. Yeah. Well, did you have a bunch of students, nursing students, clustered around you when you gave birth? Then was it Marilyn? 
No, no, uh, no, I didn't have any, uh, nothing like that. I, well, in the meantime, there was supposed to be a tidal wave coming to Sitka that night. And a, a scotch cap, remember, do you ever remember hearing about scotch cap? I that think so. was wiped out up uh, north of us. And then we were supposed to get that tsunami that night in uh, Sitka. So everybody was running up the hill and so I took my two kids and their two suitcases with the baby stuff and Louise took her cat and her samovar and we walked up the hill to her brother's house which is high higher in the mountains so it wouldn't get wet if they had a tsunami. And uh, <laughs> uh, I was expecting the baby any day and the Cocker Spaniels expecting pups any day so we got the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> the maternity ward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and we stayed there overnight, and everything was okay. And my other two daughters in Louisiana, they stayed with all the people who were sitting around in the front room, I guess. I didn't know where they were. But the next morning, it was just an extra high tide, and it was not a tsunami. So it was okay to come down from the mountain, which we did. And uh, as soon as I got I, Phyllis in school in first grade and got the... Uh, Gail with Louise to go to the library. I called the cab and said, please take me to the, uh, what's the name of that school? Mount Edgecombe. Mount Ed, take me to Mount, no, it wasn't Mount Edgecombe. That's across on the island. It's a uh, Presbyterian school. Oh. And college, Presbyterian College in Sitka. Beautiful campus, really nice place. Mm. Yeah, so I, uh, I knew that the room, where the room was that they were expecting me to go, so I went down to the building where they had two little Eskimo girls, I think, and a nurse. They did have a nurse that worked for this college there, and uh, she was there with the little girls. And the doctor came, and of course it was just a plain old iron bed. And it was not in the hospital room, it was just a plain old iron bed. I remember hanging on the iron braces in the back. And I, she just sort of popped out, and he said, well, I never saw a white woman have it as fast as you. You're just like the Indians. I thought that was funny. I guess he thought it was a big compliment. So, anyway, it was an easy birth. Phew. Well, it wasn't easy leading up to it, so there had to be a payoff somewhere, yeah. right? And my brother had sent my brother, one of my brothers was a doctor, and he'd sent me directions for how to deliver your baby at home in case I didn't get off the island in time to get to Sitka. So, so I didn't have to use that either. So that was great. <laughs> that no, was prepared. <laughs> I can't imagine. Um, well, so then you're six years in uh, between Bjorka and, and uh, Sitka, and then you and the family moved to Lake Menchumina. Yeah, I can't, I, um, Frank bid on a Minchumina station. He was a radio operator for the CAA or the FAA or whatever it is. <clears throat> and so he liked that station. It was pretty, it was closer to Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. So we left, moved up there. Of course, there was no school there, no stores there, no nothing there, but this is the places for people to live, you know, more apartment things, houses. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I like, you did some surveying there. But then you also became a cook there. How did yeah, that, that was come a about? Lake McEwen. Well, the uh, FAA was going to build a new building there, and uh, and then, in fact, I was engaged as a uh, surveyor for it to lay out the pans where the building was supposed to be, and so that was my first part of it. So I did that. Uh, my two older girls I sent to St. Helens Hall and. Portland to go to girls school because we there's no school in Lake Michigan and my other girl was only about five years old so she uh, stayed. Yeah, she could be home uh, So that's so I went to to work to do that But I'd been there not very long. Well, I did have to go on Yeah, it was very poor on rain. I remember that and I had a machete and I had a chop down all the little wheels and everything to make a path so I could see where to put the building. So I had my transit slogging around in the mud out there. Got, got it all laid out and done so they could uh, start to build the building. <coughs> anyway, I got the surveying all done and they got a crew out there to build the building. And there was um, a man from Texas, a big man from Texas and three in Eskimos, I think. 
there were 16 men and he needed somebody to cook for him. So the FA guy came down and asked me, please, would I cook for him? And my husband said, no, 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 no. I said, no, sorry, I can't do it. No, can't do it. So then a couple more days, their supplies hadn't come and they didn't have a cook and came, please, will you please come and cook for us? Just so they're begging you. <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, how much do you pay? And it was $2 and a half an hour. So I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> a fortune. <laughs> a fortune, yeah. So anyway, that's how it happened that I got to be the cook there. But it was okay. I had a young man, a uh, young boy, actually, he's probably about 17 or 18 maybe, that did the dishes and set the table and chopped the wood and stuff like that. So I didn't have to do everything. I just had to cook. And I had to learn how to make five pies at once and cook for 16 people is a little different than cooking for your family. So uh, it took me a few days to catch on because it's one old wood stove. So, to, so yeah, paint us a picture. What were, were what was the layout for you? Oh, cooking? yeah, that's right. It was a, uh, what do you call them? It was a great big canvas uh, tent things. What do they call them? And the men lived in the back. They had their beds back there. And then in the front part was uh, like the dining room and the kitchen. Art. That was the, the company thing. And then next door to us was a smaller tent, and that's where the electricians lived. And most of them were from Texas, I think. There was a great big guy called Tex, and he was a boss there. And he liked beans for lunch, for sure. And I always had to cook beans for that guy. And he was a bad guy. Every Saturday night when they got their checks, they'd gamble and so forth. And one fellow got lost his check. I guess it was Tex, it must have been Tex. And so he got so mad that the other guy wouldn't give it back to him or something that he beat him up. We had to call a uh, wire to Anchorage to fly a plane out to pick him up and take him into the hospital because he beat him up so bad he couldn't work or anything. Wow. This rough old guy, that Tex, yeah. So that was just shortly before they started shooting at the numbers and the clock and. So they were kind of upset because they didn't have any work to do. They were drinking and they were shooting at the numbers and the clock. And the shells were coming through the tents, of course, and coming over and hitting the pans in the kitchen. So at first I didn't know what was happening. And I could see this ping, ping, ping. Oops. <laughs> anyway, I packed up everything and took my little girl and moved into Fairbanks and lived with Lillian Crossan, who had just lost her husband, Joe Crossan, who was a famous pilot. Oh, sure. And I became the see, city engineer, was that what it was? Yeah, you were city engineer for a while. I was a city engineer, so we, between the two of us, we knew practically everything that was happening in town. She worked for the newspaper and I worked for the city. I worked for the city. That's right. Uh, and, well, you were, uh, at that time, they were putting in some new sewer pipes that would uh, with, withstand the cold a little bit better. Was that during your stint as city yeah, we had wooden uh, circular pipes, and they took them out and put in. Uh, we had to get, make new uh, ditches and everything to put them in. Yeah, that's right. A I big did. project. Is it was a big engineer. project. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it went on for a couple of years, as a matter of fact. That's right. So you go to Fairbanks. You work for a while as city engineer, but you and um, your husband Ben at the time start a little newsletter about the oil industry. Oh yeah, we did. Now, why <coughs> did you do that? Did you see a need? Was there a need that you two saw? Yeah, Ben knew about oil. He'd worked up in the slope, you know, for the military people before the, they discovered oil up there. Yeah, and uh, he did. He planned, they'd planned to run a gas line down to Fairbanks and he'd done a lot of that work on that. So he was very aware of the potential there and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then he knew all the terms and conditions, and so he encouraged me to write this uh, little paper thing. So it turned out to be instead of three pages, it turned out to be about eight pages and getting bigger every time. <laughs> but I just enjoyed it because I had to call Anchorage every day to find out how deep the wells were, all the different wells and things, and. It was it was very interesting. I and you distributed it. to like two hundred or so. Yeah, people. people subscribed to it. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's quite entrepreneurial. And I, we should say that, of course, you and Frank separated and later divorced. And eventually you would marry Ben Atkinson, who died. Died. <laughs> but before he died, he was an engineer for well, the yeah. University of Alaska. Well, was before he... that, he worked up in the slope and he knew mm -hmm. all the terms for um, uh, for about oil drilling and everything like that. Because that's an, he built the first... Uh, when they started to come up there to drill, they didn't know how to protect it in the winter time. But he devised the covering that they should use over the drill, so that they could go ahead and drill. So he d designed that for him. So that was a f one of the first things he did. Mm -hmm. So he was very much involved in the oil business too. Uh -huh. But it was for the Navy. And I should say, if that weren't uh, entrepreneurial enough, you're at the same time, weren't you, a regent on the Board of Regents for the University oh, of Alaska? Oh, yeah, I guess I was. You've lived such a rich life now. Um, I forgot. Yeah, you were appointed to the Board of Regents. Yeah, but we used to have the legislature every two years instead of every year. It was every two this years. This is when it was still a territory. It was a territory. And then it became a state and everything. that It was every year. So it made a difference. And uh, the last governor was all through with his, his term, I guess, it seemed to me. But anyway, the, I forget the name of the Heinzelman. man who appointed me. Heinzelman, yeah. He was a sort of a temporary president. And he appointed me to the Board of Regents. He and, was the one. <laughs> well, you were on there and then we up for another six or eight years. Well, the so terms are eight years. years, but I was on nine years because I was appointed at the year when there was no legislature. You know, it was every two years and I got appointed in the in-between year. So I served one year without being acknowledged as a regent. And then the next eight years, I was legal, legal regent. <laughs> Well, now this is the time when Ernest Patty was president. What was he like as a oh, person? Oh, he was great. He was wonderful. He was a very. He just was a very vibrant, uh, busy man with a lot of good ideas. Everybody liked him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a great guy. Yeah. Yeah, and what was the? What did you regions? This is a time of growth for the University of Alaska. It's really expanding. It's post-war. It's moving in, as we say, the oil industry is starting to to really grow in the state. So it must have been a vital, vibrant time to be on the board of regents. It was a busy time. <laughs> it sure was. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. I didn't know what it was exactly that I was supposed to do, but at the first meeting. They discussed whether or not they should have a civil engineering building. And a lot of guys were against it, but um, Mr. Rasmussen? Masterson and I thought they should have one for the civil engineers. And so all the rest of the guys went along with it, and we got our building. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure the civil engineers are grateful to you. <laughs> they don't even know I did it, I don't think. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, all right. Um, I just wanted to touch base because you played such a remarkable role in the school's history and also in the state's history. So going back now to reporting on the oil industry itself, so you, you and Ben start this newsletter, it takes off, mm -hmm. as does the oil industry. Mm -hmm. How did you, what were your impressions about the industry in its early days in Alaska? Well, I was just as excited about it as everybody else. You know, I thought it was great, wonderful. And uh, I started writing little stories for the news miner about it, just little stories. I, would, I wasn't really working for the news miner. I just write the stories. And finally, they uh, asked me to work for them. I have to say, reading your articles from that time, you really get a sense that you're caught up in the excitement and the possibilities of oh, that yes. time. Oh, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I liked every minute of it. Did you? Oh, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I like writing. I like flying. I like the oil business. You know, it was, it was great. And I also noticed um, you really know your audience. For example, many of your pieces were for oil industry magazines or, or newsletters or uh, columns. And 
you know what the engineers want to know, you know what the industry people want to know. You have a wonderful facility with words, but you also drop in the key details that for someone like me, for example, I wouldn't have an idea what a diameter of pipe or what a gravel pad or pouring oh. concrete would be. But you have specific details along with the color of the spot. Did writing come easily for you? Well, yes, it did, because I loved to do it and I liked the, the subject I was working on. Yes, I did, and uh, the um, Oil Week of Calgary, Canada is my favorite one to write for. I really started with them <coughs> and because they liked everything I did. They never changed it, and they sent me a check right away. <laughs> <laughs> well, Can't I would that. like that, too. <laughs> yeah, that was my favorite one, but then I got... I'd meet other people when I went up to the slope for different stories or things. I'd meet other people who came from California or New York or something, and they didn't want to come to Alaska. Mm. And so they'd say, well, why don't you write this story for me, you know, and you, we'll pay you. So I, that's how I got started. And then my name got around so that I got, I worked for 14 different um, companies, some, I guess. Really. Some very prestigious uh, magazines and what. Oh, yeah, I did. I worked for 14 different ones, just doing stories. <laughs> and I had to turn some down at the end when I was kind of getting tired of writing. Mm -hmm. I know that they called me from uh, somewhere in Europe. Where was it? Paris? No, they wanted me to do a story on the how the uh, glaciers down in Valdez are creeping up and go to spoil the... Uh, you know, the channel for the uh, oil. Oh, the terminal. Uh, yeah, the, the terminals shipping. and shipping and everything. They want me to write a story about the glaciers and that. And I declined. I was just about the last one. I thought, no, I've just done this for a long time. I don't think I'll do that anymore. <laughs> well, it should be noted, though, um, many of your, uh, several of your pieces found its way into the congressional record. Is that right? Oh, yes. Uh, um, thanks to Ted Stevens. He always sent me little notes and things, and I sometimes would send him some stuff. And I wrote a very comprehensive, long story, which took a long time to get all the information <coughs> about uh, uh, the this difficulties of getting things to Alaska and why, what the problems were and how they could help it and stuff. And uh, he was so impressed, he asked the Senate if he could enter into the, what was that called? Congressional record. Congressional record, yes. Yeah. So he entered two of my stories into the congressional record. It's quite an honor. Yeah, I was very surprised and pleased. Yes, I was. I'm sure you would be. Yeah. Um, so I, I think as, as we kind of move through your life here, an aspect that we haven't talked about and I never realized was really integral to your life from your early days was your painting. Uh -huh. Because as you, um, as you say, sort of gave up reporting on the oil industry, you took up painting and became quite accomplished and, and a respected painter. So how did that come about, Helen? Well, because I'd been drawing and painting since I was a little kid, I guess. <laughs> I, you know, I never just always liked to draw and paint and stuff. So. I just did it. I didn't realize that you had to take lessons. The first couple I did, I didn't have any lessons. I think they were the best ones. I did better before I took a lesson. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't Well, you matter. captured the eye of Ted Lampert, who's a respected painter. Yeah, I did a, I did a, an oil portrait of an Eskimo lady, and he liked it very much and offered to give me lessons. But unfortunately, he drowned, and mm. I never got a chance to do it. So, But I appreciate his comment. Yeah. Um, but I wonder if there's some connection between the way you paint scenes with words and the way you apply pigment to canvas. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Do you think you think and um, assimilate things visually? Are you are you attuned it, that way? Yeah, I I am. That's mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the paintings you've done that I've seen are very vivid and arresting, and then you apply that to various scenes and locales, really capturing the spirit of a place. Oh. So um, what is it about a scene or what is it about uh, something before you that attracts your eye? What do you see yeah, there? I don't know. 
I guess it's just automatic. I don't really think about it. Mm -hmm. um, when you write, remember when you um, were putting together A67, was it? Mm. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. I was. Uh, uh -huh. you, you curated and kind of put that together, and you wrote some lines about that beauty starts from within and I then moves did. without. Do yeah. you remember that? Yes, I've got it. Yeah, I, I enjoyed doing that very much. I was a coordinator for the whole thing that they had, and I had to invite other artists from the United States to come up here and be on that too. And uh, that turned out very well. But I kind of want to talk about that just briefly because in there you say that in Alaska, there are so many possibilities that artists approach the land with this wide open appreciation. And the beauty of the land is what informs. That's why we don't have grotesques or, you know, um, sort of troubling images. Mm -hmm. The possibilities are there. Mm -hmm. Your life seems to characterize what is possible and you seem to always grasp what was possible. Mm. Life's always been kind of an adventure for you, I take it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and you've always I've been liked very lucky, it. I think. I've been very lucky. Mm -hmm. And you've always seemed to love learning and then giving back, too. Well, yeah. Helen, I want to thank you so much for taking time to talk with me today. Well, I hope I gave you the information you wanted. <laughs>